Hello everybody, uh, this is Paul Sidwell and today I'm going to talk about how I'm reconstructing the Proto-Austroasiatic vowels. So specifically, I'm reconstructing the Proto-Austroasiatic word. This is the word in the prosaic lexicon. I think the grammatical and expressive lexicons had slightly different phonotactics and, and, and possibilities. Uh, and I'm using the template presented here, which is more or less the same template uh, as I presented in uh, the 2014 handbook. As far as I can tell, additional structures are not required to account for the comparative data I'm aware of, although we can predict uh, the greater morphological complexity was possible. The task is to reconstruct the nuclei of the stressed syllables. That's the big V in the template. I'm now finalizing a reconstruction of the Proto-Austroasiatic lexicon and phonology in collaboration with Mark Alves, and I have a solution now which I'm ready to present with high confidence, while acknowledging that some unresolved issues and problematic etymologies remain. Of course, I'm not the first to look at this problem. In fact, I'm only building on the tremendous work that's gone before me. So. It seems that the vowel issue was first seriously considered by Pino, uh, 1959, in the context of his Proto Munda, and it was uh, further considered by various scholars over the, the following decades. Some scholars had real doubts that the Proto AA vowels could be recovered. In the 60s, the idea of the phoneme was at its zenith in linguistics, and scholars working on various Austroasiatic languages, they were aghast at the vocalic complexities, and they struggled analytically. In 1964, David Thomas offered this programmatic advice. He wrote, I feel that the solution lies in starting at the very lowest level of comparison, working on adjacent languages to establish protoforms at that level, then using these reconstructions as the basis for comparison at the next level. Only in this way, I feel, will the mont vowels be able to be solved. Well, this advice inspired various scholars to pursue low-level reconstructions. For example, Blood's Proto Menong, Dot Thomas's Proto Iskatuic, and others. And these influenced other scholars. Actually, especially in the USSR, um, Dot Thomas's thesis influenced Sokolovsky's work on Vietic, Yefimov's work on Banaric, Peyros's work on Katuic and AA. However, the, the overall results were not so great. What, what happened? Well, the results of comparative work were quite disparate. Researchers internationally didn't form a coherent community or have strong leadership. Austroasiatic conferences fizzled out in the late 70s. Data sharing and access was difficult. And some graduate students who were interested nonetheless lacked appropriate supervision. Also, important issues such as registers, register formation, tonogenesis, diphthongization, and others were not deeply understood, and a coherent typology and synthesis only began to emerge in the 1980s and really firmed up in the early 21st century. So, in the 70s in particular, concerned scholars realised that a comprehensive bottom-up reconstruction was practically difficult and introduced tremendous analytical difficulties. And some specific proposals came forward in this time. Shorto, who was particularly influenced by Demphol's Proto-Austronesian methodology, he took a Telio reconstruction approach, selecting a couple of criterion languages, Mon and Khmer. In this way, he wanted a method to cut through the apparent 
data chaos and focus on the strongest signal. He wrote, it follows that the wider extension of a cognate set, the greater the chance of its including one or more vowel variants. A comparison which embraces the largest possible number of languages will elicit a very large number of overlapping, partially similar correspondences. On the other hand, in a comparison restricted to two languages, we would expect a relatively high number of regularly related cognates and a similar number of irregular cognates attributable to variation. Well, the results of Shorto's approach uh, were realized in his 2006 Comparative Dictionary. In retrospect, the choice of criterion languages and the ways that data from other languages were integrated analytically badly skewed Shorto's results. Still, he did deliver a well-organized data set. Gerard, Gerard de Flotte, uh, at the same time, had a different approach. He had a, a good understanding of a broad range of data, and he recognized that some branches are quite restructured and preserve much less material that's relevant to Proto-Austroasiatic. So selection of branches is important. In 1979, he advised, among the 14 or so extant branches of the Moncomier family, only three or four have developed and preserved enough differentiation today to yield proto-branch reconstructions of great antiquity. They are the Banaric, Aslian, Palangic, and probably Viet Mung. It is mostly from these reconstructions that we'll be able someday to cast a glance at proto mont -Khmer and beyond. This is a crucial programmatic statement Given the state of knowledge in 1979, the Flot was making a well-informed speculation that I think was broadly correct. Regrettably, he didn't subsequently follow through and present such a study while he lived. In fact, Gerard told me personally once that he thought it would be a 50-year project. Well, it's, it's already near 50 years. So what I'm discussing today, I'm calling a modified Deflot inspired approach, which is now paying dividends. So in all this time, we're in a situation where we have branches, sorry, we have decades of branch level reconstruction that's now clarified many data issues. And we can confidently identify which languages and branches show internal depth and phonological and lexical archaisms. Reconstruction of Benaric, Aslian, Palangic, Vietic is well developed. However, Benaric is very problematic, having suffered strong influence from Khmer and Chamic in particular, so it can't be so straightforwardly compared. Palangic and Vietic are certainly crucial, with specific languages such as Lamet and the, the Chuklects. They're recognizably archaic so that we can place strong reliance on them. Also, Kumu is important when controlled for Khmer, sorry, for Palangic loans, and I've discussed this at previous conferences. Nonetheless, Palangic, Khmu, and Vietic are geographically northern, so control is needed to ensure that Etama go back to Proto-Austroasiatic. This is where the importance of Aslian comes in. Aslian is isolated from northern Austroasiatic for millennia. So we're confident that cognates between Aslian and northern AA go back to Proto-Austroasiatic. And of course, the same logic applies to some other branches, which we can also apply. Now, as I argued at CLS 32 earlier this year, South Aslian vowel timbre is more archaic than northern or central Aslian. 
although we can rely on the latter to reconstruct vowel length. So we can revise proto uslian vowels and improve Philip's proto uslian Consequently, a direct vowel comparison um, of correspondences between Aslian, Kmu, Palaundric, and Vietic allows us to model Proto-Austroasiatic vocalism with a high degree of confidence. Data from other branches can be interpreted in that light with a full integration of the data affected. So now we have the results. So here are the Proto-Austroasiatic long vowels. You can see the overall inventory resembles that of Shorto's vowels, although many specific vowel assignments vary from etymology to etymology. Importantly, Shorto's vowel alternances, as he called them, are largely eliminated with ambiguous reconstructions, mostly caused by data gaps. Now, looking at some specific points, the a is in complementary distribution with ia. So presently, I'm only reconstructing the a before laryngeals and ia elsewhere. So this is a phonetically realistic reconstruction in my view. Also, I'm provisionally reconstructing an oa diphthong, and this is due to reflexes in Nicobrees and Benaric. Um, specifically, we have etima like ka, fan, for, meh, for nose, etc. Similar uh, forms with front vowels where we have a back vowel in the rest of the family. These could be an allophone of o. Oh. In fact, I think they probably are. But for now, I'm using this as a, a notational device to uh, highlight this correspondence. Also, unlike short o, I'm reconstructing an u uh vowel, and this uh, relies on a correspondence of kamu u uh, to vietic e. Note that the high central vowels in Aslian actually go back to other origins, so they're not helpful in this case. And here's some supporting data. So please forgive me for cramming so much text on one slide, but uh, you can go and grab the, the PDF. It'll be on my personal site and also on the ICAL site. And I've got um, three reflexes here supporting each uh, of the long vowels uh, and one for the OI just for illustrative purposes. And you can work through these for yourself, but you can see in this second column, Semalai Mamari, that's the South Aslian, you can see in particular how the vowel values strongly agree with Kamul Palandric and Vietic values. And this, in my view, is clearly common inheritance. It couldn't possibly be some sort of accidental convergence. So I'm very confident that this is uh, the way to Proto-Austroasiatic. Okay, uh, let's look at the short vowels. So, overall, the short vowels are largely consistent with Shorto's non khmer comparative dictionary reconstructions. The e e are infrequent segments. So these do pose some difficulties of interpretation, but they do seem to contrast particularly before laryngeals. Otherwise, many at tokens in the data are underlyingly a fronted a, usually in association with a palatal consonant. So actually, the short at is really quite a marginal phoneme. But its presence before laryngeal structurally parallels the long a. So I'm fairly confident in this. 
I also do reconstruct a short I, and in this case, I rely on reflexes in Camus and in South Aslian, where they agree phonetically very well. Now, uh, another point about the short vowels is that the short A in Aslian actually has oddly diverse reflexes, frequently A, E, and O, as well as the occasional A. This is at odds with the other vowels where South Aslian seems to be very conservative. But it seems that in this case, because you had a collapse of the uh, voicing contrast in South Aslian, perhaps these serve to, um, to avoid mergers lexically. Anyway, the short R is surely an um, uncontroversial vowel to reconstruct, so I'm, I'm happy to interpret the evidence in this way. Overall, words with short vowels are proportionally much fewer in the lexicon, and this means a lot more data gaps. But if we assume strong parallelism between the short and long vowel inventories, I think we can have a lot of confidence in interpreting the correspondences. And here's some examples. So uh, there's a couple for each here. Um, Unfortunately, it's it's difficult to give very comprehensive summary presentations like this because of the, the shortage of short vowel reflexes. But overall, they pattern very well, and you can see that there is pretty good um, correspondence here between the central Aslian, sorry, South Aslian, and the northern Austroasiatic vowels with the exception of the art, which is at the bottom of the, uh, of the table there. OK, so let's uh, move along to our uh, final summary. Overall, the vowel reconstruction shows no structural features that suggest a breathy register system. After all, the consonants are conservative and there's no sort of paired development of vowels that indicates anything like that. However, um, syllable glottalization or coda glottalization does seem to be suggested strongly by Vietic, Bacanic, possibly Hmong. So I am reconstructing this for the proto-language uh, independent of vowel timbre. Also, it's worth noting that assuming that there was a short long vowel contrast before laryngeals, um, it's unnecessary to posit any open syllables in the uh, prosaic vocabulary. Uh, and this is something that other researchers have assumed in the past. I have aggregated correspondence across all 14 branches, and they seem to align pretty well with the Aslian Kamu Palangic Vietic approach. Uh, once you allow for those languages that have undergone vowel restructuring. So overall, I'm pretty confident. There is a big cluster of problem vowel correspondences in Benaric and Katuic, but I find that these often align phonetically, particularly with Old Khmer and sometimes Old Mon, um, often later forms of Khmer as well. So I treat these as a contact phenomenon rather than indicating the need to posit any additional proto vowels. And I come back to Asli and Kamul Palandric Vietic as the bedrock for the reconstruction. So, on the basis of all this, Proto Austroasiatic lexicon is now being written up for presentation, and uh, you'll be able to see it soon. And here are my references. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much.